Okay. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session. So, of course, today we are going to work through the residence time distribution uh, tutorial. And uh, we'll be working through the questions, some of those questions in the tutorial. But, uh, of course, we can also pause along the way and expand on any of the questions or comments that you might have on RTD. So, of course, RTD, um, residence time distribution, it's quite a different uh, approach to modeling and development uh, than you are used to. So although it, it does uh, start from material balances on a tracer and so on, very quickly it goes into this kind of abstract age space and, um, and it requires shifting gears a bit to, uh, to fully understand and engage with this material. So I'm happy to spend uh, a fair bit of time on the theory as well, if you like. Um, any questions or comments on that so far? <clears throat> so let's, uh, I'm just going to share screen. And let's go to the tutorial. Uh, so let's look at the question. Um, so question one, um, we can have a quick look at this question. So here um, it says we've got this tracer data available. So we have some real reactor where uh, some measurements were taken. And let's, uh, let's start sketching these things out. So we've got some reactor and we're not sure what type of mixing was going on in that reactor. That's why we were doing the RTD study. So we've got our feed in here. So we are feeding tracer into this reactor. And then uh, we are observing the tracer concentration at the exit. So let's assume this was a pulse input here. So at some time T naught, we pulsed tracer into the system. Um, so that's T naught. And then we observed the tracer concentration at the exit. So the concentration did something like this. And uh, it turns out that we have all the measurements available here. So we know with time how that concentration was varying. And this is, of course, something we can do in the real world, right? We can pulse tracer in and we can measure the concentration as it's coming out. So number one, we want to plot E of theta. And so, <clears throat> of course, the easiest way to do that is to use the formula. And I'm just going to use, um, I started a bit of a tutorial notes document. Yeah, so, so for this question one, of course, we want uh, E of theta. And we know that's the same as uh, C, uh, so the concentration of tracer. Um, and that's as a function of T. So the concentration of tracer is available as a time function. But if we've defined uh, t naught to be zero, then we can rewrite this as theta. Right? And that's something I kind of neglect a bit in the notes. In the, in the notes and in some of the videos, I went straight into just assuming um, we can switch t with theta. And of course, we had established this relationship early on. We said um, the age, uh, your age, if you like, is equal to the current time minus your birth date, so t sub zero. And uh, of course, your birth date is a significant date to you. But um, in terms of, uh, of a reactor, let's say, um, the, the birth time of the tracer is the, the time of injection uh, into the reactor. And, and that time is not important at all, right? The time that you inject into the reactor doesn't matter to you or to anyone or to the tracer itself. So we are free to just define T naught to be zero. So even though the, the time of injection might be, um, you know, the, the fourth of, of November, uh, two o'clock in the afternoon, um, it doesn't matter. We can just call that time zero. 
Um, and if we call t naught zero, then of course this t uh, must also have that same reference. So if, if our current time is, is five minutes past two, um, and, and this uh, time in, in terms of our usual reference time is, is, uh, is, is two o'clock, then this time we would actually count as, as five minutes. We won't count this as, as five minutes past two anymore. So we can shift our time scale around as we like. It, it doesn't matter. So uh, just assuming t naught equals zero, then we get theta equals t. So uh, we can just rewrite this as ct of, of theta. And then uh, we can say uh, that divided by the integral. So that's the integral um, and over the limits uh, zero to infinity um, of, of the same function. Right, then that's how we can get E of theta. <clears throat> and is, is everyone uh, clear about that? Are there any questions on how we arrived at this in the first place? Right, so if, if that's fine, then um, we can see that we could simply take our function CT. So we can just take um, this function and of course, um, this is not given to us as a function, it's given to us as a set of numbers. But of course we can construct a function out of this, right? Um, we, we have um, basically, if, if you regard T as X and C as Y, then we've got Y of X. So we could simply uh, construct um, the function Y of X um, through uh, fitting the curve. So number one, you could propose some, uh, some power law type equations and fit C uh, to T. So you, you can form, uh, you, you can create a function or you can get it by interpolation. So you could simply interpolate between values to get the intermediate numbers. And so <clears throat> you can create a continuous function then, right? So um, th that's, uh, we assume that's what we are doing here. And, and so we know that we can create the function CT of theta. Then the other thing we need uh, is of course to divide by the integral under this area. And um, let's draw that a bit bigger here. So we've got some function like this. And we want the area under this function. And so we can simply do that by uh, numerically estimating it, right? So number one, um, yes, it, it curves here and so on, but we could get by with little triangles. So if we uh, take, a, let's say a, a triangle here and one here, and then um, maybe one here, then you can see you can get the area of this triangle because you can estimate a number here, a number here and a height here. And similarly here, this trapezoid. So we can estimate all these numerically. And so we can get this integral as a single number. And then it of course integrates from naught to infinity, but we can see this function is close to zero down here. So we know that um, if we, uh, as you go off to infinity, you no longer get a, a contribution to your integral. So you, you can just integrate uh, up to this point instead, right? The, the other contributions will be zero. So we can easily estimate the denominator here and, uh, and, and that's basically how uh, you can get this part. So that part's easy, right? Um, the next thing is uh, calculate the mean residence time, uh, well, and standard deviation. And we actually didn't spend um, any time talking about this uh, during the lectures. And um, le let's talk about this. So mean residence time, um, it's, it's kind of a new concept for us, right? We, um, we've met space time. So we, we know that space time or we anticipate space time is the average time spent by the fluid in the reactor. Um, so we, we had talked about this quantity, right? We had uh, talked about tau. So have defined um, tau, defined tau as average time spent 
in the reactor. And um, we had some justification for that. Um, we had talked about velocity and length and flow rate and volume. And, and we, we used a, a reasoning based on um, that if you take velocity and, and you compare it with uh, the distance traveled and the time to travel that distance, right? We, we know that's uh, average velocity, right? So <clears throat> in a similar way, uh, we could say um, that if you take volume and divide it by volumetric flow rate, then uh, we anticipate that tau is something like the, the average time spent there. Um, so, so if you like, there are analogs here. And in fact, uh, let me write that a bit differently. I should write this, the tau down here and the Q here. So your volumetric flow rate, that's like your uh, velocity analog. And then the volume is like your distance analog. And then the time taken is uh, your space time here. So, <clears throat> so that's, uh, that, that's something we, we define kind of loosely. And now we are able to do this more precisely uh, because we now actually have the age distribution. So because we actually know an age distribution now, we could use um, a, a process to estimate the average age spent um, by uh, something in the system. So um, we could say there exists some average age in our reactor, which is going to be obtained um, as a kind of weighted sum. So the integral going from naught to infinity um, four, and we're going to say here theta times E of theta in D theta. Right, so let's think about what this means here. This is saying um, that you take your fraction, remember E of theta delta theta is, is the fraction of fluid in a certain age range, right? So E of theta delta theta, that's a fraction of your fluid. And we are multiplying by theta here. So if you like, this is the weighted fraction of all the ages in the reactor. And let's think about that in the reactor. So in the reactor, you've got all these fluid elements of different age. And um, you can think about uh, trying to work out what the average age is. So let's say you were just looking in the reactor and um, you didn't know anything about space time or anything like that. You, you, all, all you could see was into the reactor all you could see was each particle, you could see what the age of, of each little thing is. And so you wanted to know what's the average age among all these things. And the way you could do that is by counting up, by, by specifying a certain age range. So let's say you said, um, okay, how about between one and two minutes? So between one minute and two minutes, how many fluid elements are there like that? So maybe there are three fluid elements between one and two minutes. And then let's think about between two minutes and three minutes. <clears throat> Writing with the mouse is a little tricky. And let's say there are seven particles that have been in the reactor between two and three minutes. Then, of course, if you take some average age here, so let's say you take uh, 1.5 and you take 2.5 here, then you could say three times uh, 1.5 plus seven times 2.5, right? So I'm taking halfway. So the 1.5 is midway inside of this time range. 2.5 is midway inside this time range. And then if we went ahead and divided that by the total number of particles, let's say 10 particles there. Then do you agree this would be a good estimate for the average age um, in that reactor? All right, so that's nothing but the average age in the reactor. And now you see here, it's three divided by 10 and seven divided by 10. So that's the fraction of fluid elements 
Uh, so three divided by 10 is the fraction of fluid elements between one and two minutes. And so here, E of theta, delta theta, uh, we've defined it such that that's the fraction of fluid elements in age range theta to theta plus delta theta, right? Theta to theta plus delta theta. So we, uh, and then we are multiplying by the age itself. So multiplying by the 1.5. So this is, if you like, the continuous form of doing that. So that's how we estimate the average age in our reactor. We just multiply uh, the age by the distribution function and integrate over all possible ages, not to infinity. And then that gives us the average age there. Okay, so <clears throat> for, our, um, for, for this problem, uh, we want to know the mean residence time. So we just go ahead and do this process. So in part A of the problem, we got E of theta. So we found E of theta in this way. And then it's a short step. Uh, we, we just have to multiply by theta. So we take the same distribution function that we found there. We, we multiply by theta and then we add up over all thetas. So that will give us the average age in that reactor. Um, any questions or comments there? Okay, um, so that, that's all you have to do in this question one, right? Um, so you get E of theta and you get the mean residence time. So it's, uh, it's a bit more numerical than anything else. Okay, so that's just processing your age distribution to some extent. Um, then we've got this nice problem here uh, where we have to think our way through some of these age distributions. And so, I, and I think I, I did a little bit of this in one of the lecture videos, but let's just do it now. Um, and let's just switch this a bit. So let's think about the plug flow reactor and the CSTR. And and we know what the RTD looks like in these cases. And at least uh, I'll draw I of theta here. So we know the exit age distribution is this discontinuous function. So it's zero everywhere, except at um, um, some, uh, the, the, the space time here, tau, and then it's back to zero here. Right, so that's um, the age distribution in a plug flow reactor. And then in a CSTR, on the other hand, it's quite different. So for the CSTR, E of theta is an exponential die off. So it's just something like that, right? And of course it's decaying towards the zero. And now um, let's think about the influence of um, a first dead space in the reactor. So let's say we have some dead space in here. So we've got our reactor and let's just say um, a bird flew in or maybe better a, a rock fell in, something like that, right? So somehow the volume of the reactor reduced, okay? So what's the impact of that going to be? So once more, the, the line that we just drew is when we didn't have a reduction of volume. Right now, we, we've, redu we've lost volume for whatever reason. And <clears throat> we want to know how our curve is going to shift in response. So uh, the, the best way to answer that is to think about what happens to the space time. And of course, we know that space time is... Uh, is the volume over the flow rate. 
So we are saying the volume has reduced now. That means our space time is also reducing. And we know that this spike is at the space time of that reactor. So if that's the case, then our space time is simply going to reduce in this case. And uh, more physically, uh, well, well, let's just draw it first. So your space time will reduce. That means basically your peak here is going to shift to the left to a lower value. And it's still zero here, still zero here, and zero here. Oops. I'm trying to keep that as an empty point and zero there. All right, so it, it shifts to the left here, right? That's the result of having dead space or dead volume in that reactor. And uh, another way to think of this is if you have suddenly dead volume in the reactor, then there's less volume for your fluid to flow through, right? So you had five cubic meters, then after something fell in, uh, you only have four cubic meters now. So you only have four cubic meters to pass through that reactor, even though your flow rate is the same. So when we said uh, dead volume, we didn't say there was any other change to the system. So that means your volumetric flow rate is still the same. So if your flow rate is the same, but you've got less volume to travel through, then you're going to spend less time in that reactor. And that's what this peak shifting this way means, right? You're, you're spending less time over here. So uh, the PFR case, I think, is, is pretty straightforward. Let's think about the CSTR. So for the CSTR, if you follow the videos, um, you will have seen that the age distribution is 1 over tau uh, times x of minus theta over tau. Right, so that's what we have for the CSTR. And now we are saying due to dead volume, um, we've got a reduced V and so a reduced tau. So we've got a smaller tau. That means one over tau is going to be bigger, right? And of course here, if theta equals zero, then E equals one over tau. So the intercept, so where theta equals zero, uh, right, where all of this goes to one, this one over tau is going to be a bigger number. So we are going to start off higher here. So we will start somewhere here. And now um, if we think about points uh, to the right of that, you've got uh, theta over tau. And um, well, maybe let's just rewrite that slightly like so. So your variable here so I'm just going to make this theta here, theta. So now you've got one over tau times minus theta. So theta is the variable we're, we're not talking about, uh, we, we can't talk about any change to theta, but we are changing the coefficient next to that theta. So we are replacing uh, this coefficient with the larger number that means this number is going to be more negative. So as theta varies, um, the, the argument of that exponential is going to be a larger negative number. That means it's going to drop off more sharply, right? So this was always a drop off. Now with the smaller tau, uh, one over tau is bigger. So it's a larger negative number. So the drop off will be sharper as well. So it's going to start out higher and drop down more sharply. So it's going to do this. Right, so it's the same exponential die off, but it's a sharper drop off. And of course, this has to be the case because if we are starting out higher, remember um, we are requiring that the integral of E of theta in theta this integral over all possible ages. So all possible ages are zero. You can't have negative ages. So the lowest value is zero. And then we don't have an upper bound. So we just say infinity. So if we add up all the fractions um, over all possible ages, that must always be a one. And now we know that um, one over tau being, uh, being a bigger number because V is smaller, because tau is smaller, um, that means we start out at a higher value. 
And so in order for us to preserve this, in order for the area under the red curve to be the same one as the area under the blue curve, we also have to drop off faster. So mathematically, at least, it makes sense to us that the drop-off must be faster if it's also to be an, uh, a distribution function like this one. So that's just mathematically. Um, in terms of physically, if you have a reduced volume, again, you have less uh, space to occupy and less space to traverse uh, to reach the exit. So your die-off from this reactor will be faster. So... Um, when you pulse tracer into this reactor, you have less volume to occupy. So you'll start out with a higher number, but because also you've got less volume, you, you will die out faster from that space. And, and so uh, you, you die out faster here. So that's the influence of uh, dead volume. Um, any questions or comments there so far? Okay, so that's one variant on the flow. And then let's think about, um, yeah, the influence of bypassing. So what if we have uh, a second variant, which is um, the influence of bypassing in each case? So if we bypass this reactor, if at least part of the fluid, uh, make that a bit more vivid, right? So we can bypass this reactor or part of the fluid bypasses the reactor, right? And, and so now we are going back to the case where we didn't have a uh, dead volume. So uh, in, in this kind of green, in this turquoisey uh, case, uh, we don't have dead volume, but we have bypass. And so we also have bypass here. So if there's bypass uh, across the system, then uh, the amount of fluid that's entering here, the flow rate into the reactor is reduced, right? The volume is now constant. We've got the same volume, but the, the volumetric flow rate is less. And there you can, of course, imagine that it, it's simply going to be the reverse case, that now you will have, um, uh, you'll have a, uh, a, a bigger tau, right? Your, you have a slower flow through here and this, the original volume, you've got a slower flow. So you aren't passing through as quickly as before. So you are going to spend more time in that reactor. So your space time is going to go up. And so your curve is going to shift to the right in this case. And so you will see this, right? And there's a big missing piece to this, right? Can you tell me what's missing, right? Fine, it's, uh, we are going to see um, slower, the tracer is going to come through here more slowly. What's the missing piece to this? All right, so I'll let you think about that as I continue talking about the CSTR, but I'm going to ask you again just now, Am I not missing something when I'm drawing this graph? Okay, now uh, for the CSTR, um, here again, uh, we go back to the original volume V. There's no um, uh, dead volume anymore. But again, we are bypassing some of that reactor and we are measuring out here. So <clears throat> our flow rate through here is reduced, right? So lower flow means a higher uh, space time. We're spending more time here. So one over tau is a smaller number. So now we are starting at a lower value. And uh, also because the flow rate is slower, it takes more time to die out from here. So the die out rate is lower. So we don't exponentially decay out as fast. So that's what happens in that case. And again, in this case, there's a missing feature here. Can you tell me what that is? Okay, so we've got a taker. So Mohammed says, is there supposed to be a pulse from the bypass as well as the reactor superimposed? So uh, good, that's exactly what I was looking for. So thanks, Mohammed. Yes, um, we have pulsed tracer in, and of course we've pulsed the tracer in here. 
And so you've got a pulse that goes through here. It gets delayed by the time tau P for plug, if you like. So you get one, so the tracer, so some tracer comes in here and gets delayed. And, and that's what we are talking about here. But then you also get some tracer going up this way, right? It's splitting. So the remember uh, something like injecting salt here. So some salt go, uh, goes through here as a pulse and then some other salt also goes up here. And so you will get another pulse that comes through from here. So you'll get another pulse there. Um, and by the way, uh, we can't talk about the height of these pulses, right? Uh, a pulse is an instantaneous jump. And um, it's like we are concentrating all the matter in one instant in time or one instant age. So all, uh, so e even though if you write a material balance, then of course there's a certain finite number of moles here, maybe 20 moles and maybe five moles go here and 15 moles go there. So uh, that's all fine. But if we are writing it as a distribution function, then um, as a distribution, uh, you know, in terms of salt distributing across time and across age, it's not distributed uh, in this, a pulse is not distributed, a, a pulse is, fully is completely concentrated in one instant. So it's going off to infinity. And even though the number of moles may differ, we, we can't actually see a difference between these two. These are both instantaneous pulses. That's the nature of a Dirac Delta, right? So anyway, um, uh, but the point is, uh, uh, so what I was asking is, uh, yes, there's a missing feature, which is that uh, when you bypass, you also have tracer coming through that way. And uh, so here, um, that's pretty clear. In this case, you, uh, you know that your exponential decay is coming through uh, from this direction, but uh, you also have tracer coming in here. And so there are going to be two contributions at time zero, one from the CSTR and one from the bypass. And I forgot to say that we regard um, these lines as zero volume lines. So uh, even though we know in a real pipeline, a real pipeline has a real thickness and a real, um, so it has a real volume, but um, um, if, if you like, it's negligibly, uh, negligibly small, uh, smaller than the volume of the unit itself. So we regard this as a zero volume. And so uh, we, we just call this a perfect zero, even though it's slightly not, right? So anyway, here we do have a, a pulse at zero as well. So here we do have a pulse now. These other ones are not pulses. Those others are starting on some finite number here, some finite number here. Whereas this one is, is off to infinity. So, so make sure you indicate it's going off to infinity with an arrowhead, right? And, and you use dots for uh, specifying it's, it's actually a value here. So here it was, uh, if you just look at this, it was a finite number, but then you're adding infinity to a finite number. So this was going off to infinity there. Okay, uh, any questions or comments on that? <clears throat> Okay, so those are the cases. Now let's think about this case, um, two plug flow reactors in parallel. So let's draw it here. Let's copy it, right? Remember to edit that part where we are talking about the tree felling. And anyway, um, so here um, we've got uh, a stream and, and here for some reason we are calling it V and this should be a Q. And then you've got a Q1 here and a Q2 here. Um, there's a question here, let's just have a look. So, Not sure what happened there. Did someone have a question? Maybe it was deleted. What? Okay, I see it's superimposed here. So what would the CSTR and PFR uh, look like if we had close to 
infinite dead space. So infinite dead space means that, well, you, um, number one, there's a certain maximum on the amount of dead space you can have here. So you can't have more dead space than you have reactor volume. So your maximum dead space is, uh, is V, right? Um, so if you go up to the maximum, um, if, if your entire reactor is filled with dead space, then your volume becomes zero. So if your volume is zero, then your space time becomes zero. And then uh, this thing, uh, let's see, yeah, this would just shift down. Um, this uh, would just shift down. That means your fluid uh, would spend no time in there. In other words, um, yeah, it's, it's basically just a pipeline. There, there's no reactor there. So, um, and, and that's if, if you take the view that that's, um, that, that that's just part of the flow, you could also argue that um, if, it's, if it's actually uh, completely obstructing flow, then, then you don't have any flow in there and, and you, don't, you, you are not able to define any age distribution there. So in the case of the plug flow, uh, your, your curve would just shift here. In the case of the CSTR, uh, it's a bit different in this case, um, it's it's a bit more interesting. So if your CSTR was completely filled, um, then basically um, the all, all that um, so that exponential decay. You can see as you are moving to uh, smaller ages, right? Um, your your curve is 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 sort of getting smashed up uh, closer and closer here. So. Um, so imagine here in the case where you had some dead volume, you can see uh, this point shifted up and, and the, the die off uh, was reduced. Uh, sorry, you had a sharper die off. So the curve was shifting in like this. So as you increase uh, V more and more, you can see what starts to happen is we get a kind of a peak effect here. Okay, let's draw that a bit better. So. So you would, you would get something like this in the case of the CSTR. And that's because then if you have no volume left in the CSTR, you have no space of perfect mixing. In other words, it's just a pipeline and uh, a pipeline is actually best modeled as a PFR with a zero uh, dead time, um, yeah, with zero um, uh, delay time. So it's, it's just a zero volume um, uh, PFR. So you, you could say a CSTR um, that's full of dead space uh, can be modeled as a PFR um, with no volume. <clears throat> uh, is, is that clear? Um, any, uh, does that answer the question? Okay. Um, Right. Okay. Um, so let's look at this case now. You've got um, your uh, two PFRs in parallel, and we are pulsing our tracer in here, and then we are measuring our tracer out here. Well, it's something, right? We are measuring out here. So let's think about what happens. So if we are pulsing tracer in here, then of course the same pulse will appear here. And of course, it's going to appear at the same instant, right? Again, we are regarding the pipelines as being zero volume. So if we uh, uh, stick in a pulse here, and remember when I'm drawing these things, um, you know, the, the time scale, so there's the zero there. So when I draw over here, then that's also the zero in the same place. So the zero is here. There. Okay, so, um, so we've got the two pulses coming in here. And now let's say uh, the space times are different. So there's tau P1 here and tau P2 that correspond to VP1 and VP2. So VP1 and VP2 may be different. Also Q1 and Q2 may be different. And it doesn't matter to us exactly what combination, which one is, is more and, and so on. 
um, because uh, we can just summarize all that through tau p. So we can say tau p1 and tau p2. So of course then, from the first tank, um, tau, uh, the, the fluid will be delayed by tau p1. And then down here, it will be delayed by tau p2. And so we, we'll get simply the uh, superimposed result of that. So we will see tau p1 here. And let's say tau p2 is there. It doesn't have to be. Tau p2 could be before tau p1. Um, we are just arbitrarily choosing this here. So there's E. And then it's going to be zero up to this point. Then there's empty here, and it's going off to infinity there. And then it's zero after that. And then just at tau p2 again, um, pushing off to infinity. So it's just this superposition of, of these two. So that's uh, your, uh, your PFRs in parallel. And now uh, let's in fact also think about the internal RTD. So let's also draw I of theta. I of theta. And of course, um, we, we should remind ourselves of the formula for I of theta. So we have I of theta equals one over tau, one over tau, one minus, uh, what is it, int of zero super theta of E of theta in theta. And so that's how you calculate the internal age distribution. <clears throat> so we can use this formula, but let's try and, and just um, kind of uh, imagine our way through it first, right? So let's imagine what happens to the tracer when it enters here. So of course the tracer is going to hit both the reactors at time zero, and they are going to spend a certain amount of time. And let's stick with our choices here, which is that uh, the space time in the first reactor is tau p1 and second one is tau p2. So here, let's just produce those points down here. And so if you think of it, um, the tracer that enters here is going to spend uh, tau p1. So the tracer will, um, will be moving through as a spike and it will exit at tau p1. That tells us that all fluid in that reactor is staying in that reactor until the specific age of tau p1. So until we reach tau p1, uh, that reactor was just retaining everything inside of it. So that means um, we have equal amounts of everything passing through. And you could argue, well, why are you saying equal amounts of everything when we know that the tracer is moving as a plug Right, so the tracer itself, it comes in as a plug, as a spike here. And then that spike, that whole spike moves like that through that reactor, right? But remember the whole point of this is not to, to uh, estimate tr uh, tracer spikes. I need your consent on it. The, the whole point of this is um, to estimate the age distribution of the fluid. So we were just using the tracer as a, as, as a kind of measurement of what each fluid element is doing. So if each fluid element is progressing as a spike through, then that means in terms of the RTD of the fluid itself, the fluid of interest to us, the reacting fluid, then every element of that fluid is retained in that reactor up to tau P1. So equal amounts because it's a cross-sectional area is the same and there's a fixed flow rate. So all the fluid elements are retained up to uh, this time tau P1. And then, um, everything exits. So, so in the reactor system, um, yeah, we have everything in there. Um, and, and actually it's not E that I'm plotting here, by the way. Um, so everything is retained by both reactors. So here I'm just talking about the first reactor 
And then, of course, the same applies here in tau P2. So the, the second reactor also retains everything and it retains it for even longer. So it retains it for a further time period, which is here. So the sum of these two, uh, uh, and let's use a different color here. So everything was retained up to time tau P1. Then after tau P1, everything exited here. So we no longer had um, this fraction of uh, fluid remaining. So this would actually drop then uh, by this amount. So it would drop. Um, and I don't want to draw it um, the same amount here, but it's going to drop down uh, to some level. Let's just put it here. And, and then after that, it's, uh, you, will, you will still have been retaining everything here. So you've lost everything in here at tau P1, but you, in, in terms of this whole system with the two reactors, you've still retained everything up to tau P2 in that second tank. So that's staying there tau p2 and then <clears throat> and then at uh, this time tau p2 everything exits from here as well and so you no longer have any fluid in the system of age greater than tau p2 so then it's down to zero there right so so that's what you get in this case and you you can also if if you use the the formula you can see this um, I don't know if I can copy this in. I don't even get a handle on it. Okay, let's just snip. So just pasting that here. Let's let's think a bit graphically about how to produce um, the curves that we've just described from from this thing. So. You can see here, uh, we are integrating up to time theta for each value of theta. So if you want to know i at a specific value of theta, then you have to integrate from naught to uh, that value of theta. So if you are interested in the value uh, here, right? you can see uh, here it's zero. So if for all points up to tau p1, it's zero. So e of theta is zero here. So uh, the integral of zero is of course zero. So this is one minus zero. So that's one, so it's one over tau. So according to this, it's going to be one over tau here. Uh, yeah, it's uh, what, what that tau means uh, we'll talk about just now, but um, it's that, that's the value there. And then when you reach tau P1, you have this instantaneous jump here. Um, now, to integrate across that jump, um, it, it's going to be, um, yeah, we, we actually need to do this in the compartment section. Um, so for now, I'm just going to say, uh, when you integrate across this, uh, remember for the Dirac Delta function, I actually can't recall going through this with this class, but um, if you integrate across the uh, Dirac Delta function, so the integral, um, so minus, infinity to infinity for the Dirac delta function. Right, is one. <clears throat> so it, it's a strange kind of spike, right? Um, let's just draw that here. So if you've got a zero here and you've got a Dirac delta function there, so that's going off to infinity and you've got zeros to the left and right, right? Then you see this is a single point, right? Everything is concentrated in this one instant in this one perfect zero. It's, not a, it's, it's by no means a continuous function well, uh, sorry, it, it, it actually is continuous. You have a value defined for each. Uh, it's, it's not differentiable. Um, uh, well, yeah, the, okay, l l let's not worry about that. <laughs> so here you've got your, um, you've got a point going off to infinity and it has zero area. It, um, 
normally when you integrate under a function, right, if you've got some function like this, you've got non-zero values for some width, right? So you've got some finite width here. Now, in this case, you have no width. So it, it's all concentrated in a single instant. And at that point, it's, it's off to infinity. Um, and, and there's no contribution from the left or right. This is all zero, this is all zero. There's no area that's coming in here. The only possible area is in the single instant. And according to our definition, um, that point is going off to infinity in such a way that when you integrate under that single point, you get a one. So this is a very special definition. And um, th this definition actually enabled a lot of development in physics uh, to the extent that one of the great physicists wrote a poem about Dirac who proposed this function and, and made everything look so simple. In fact, I think the poem is something like that uh, Dirac who showed how simple it could be. Uh, I think it ends like that. So this function has uh, enabled a, a great deal of the modern science that we have available. Um, uh, and, and it's a bit of a strange one, right? Um, a, a way for us poor human beings to arrive at understanding this function is to imagine something like the normal distribution. So the normal distribution, remember eta, and you normally specify parameters like, um, uh, uh, like mu and, and sigma. So uh, you have your, your bell distribution, your bell curve, and of course, this curve is, is all finite, but as you let uh, uh, the sigma go to zero, so as sigma goes to zero, then the width of your distribution reduces. And we know that the area under this curve is one. Um, so to keep that area being one, as you reduce your sigma, your, your curve has to go higher and higher. So uh, as I say, uh, we poor human beings can understand uh, a Dirac delta function as uh, a normal distribution where the sigma has tended to zero. So t the sigma has tended to zero that squeezed all the area into one, uh, under one point, right? So that's what we have there. So the reason I went into all that is because now if we are trying to use this formula to integrate E of theta, right? It was fine up to this point, but um, now we have to integrate across this discontinuous jump here. And so we are integrating uh, under this uh, single point. And, uh, and so there's going to be a jump in this number and it's not going to be a jump of one. Um, so I know a pure Dirac Delta function um, has an area of one, but this area is not one. And that's because not all the fluid has gone up here. So you have, um, le let me label it differently here. So you've got Q here, and then you've got Q1 here and Q2 down here. And let's let beta be the fraction of that original flow. So beta, times Q equals Q1. And uh, then correspondingly, Q2 will be one minus beta times Q, one minus beta times Q. So I'm developing my mouse writing skills here. So anyway, Q2 is like, so, <clears throat> so instead of a one, right? If you pulse here, the area under this is a one. Now, if you like, what's going up here is beta times that one, right? Beta times the area here. So there's a, a certain fraction of this, even though it's a discontinuous thing and mathematically uh, we, we don't talk about taking a, a fraction of infinity. Um, we'll, we'll still, we, um, We'll do it here in, uh, I, I guess you, uh, there are ways to, to talk about it if you take a finite and, and then let it reduce. And so you can keep track of that fraction. There, there are ways to do it, but um, we will regard this function as being beta times delta. So, um, so the, uh, the function here is not a pure Dirac delta function. Um, this function going into the, uh, the PFR here is beta times delta, and remember this is delta of theta 
minus tau P1. Uh, oh, well, that's the inlet, so we don't need that. So it, it's actually off theta, right? So at zero, at, at A is zero, there, that's there. And then what I was saying in terms of the rest of it, um, yeah, this is beta times uh, Dirac delta, theta minus tau P1. See how important it is to learn some Greek alphabet. I, ha I once had a, a professor refer to uh, eta as nita. I guess this looks a bit like an N. Anyway, um, so, so that's what's actually coming out. So when you integrate under this, this curve, you actually have a beta here. So if you like the area under the spike is beta. So it's one minus beta times tau. And so that's what you get there. So you were at tau, now you are down to one minus beta times tau. Um, so that's the drop you get there. And then when you come here, you are going to have uh, an additional one minus beta. So it's going to be one minus um, beta plus uh, one minus beta. So that's a one. So one minus one is zero. So you come down to zero here. Right, so, so that's how you get uh, the internal RTD for your two PFRs in parallel. Any questions or comments there? Okay, now there's another nice one, which I like to talk about. So now here we had a sort of a co-current flow through these P, uh, PFRs. Now let's imagine if we had we had flow through the one PFR, but then we had counter current uh, coming back through here. And I'm not going to worry too much about this dead volume here. Uh, le let's just talk about this interesting case. So I'm just going to copy this part of it out. So, so now let's imagine what happens in this case. <clears throat> so of course we are going to pulse some tracer in here. And just notice please that in each of these cases, I always do that, right? I, I don't know, uh, it, it doesn't, I, I don't know if it's a recommended way of doing this, but it, it certainly helps me when I try to reason out what the RTD is going to turn out to be, I always start with just uh, thinking if I put a pulse in, what's going to happen to that pulse when it passes through the system? So here we did that. We, we put a pulse in and we imagined, okay, part of it goes there, part goes there. We imagine putting a pulse in there and what happened to it and, and so on. So I always try to figure out when I'm given some strange uh, network, I try to imagine if I put a pulse in, what's going to happen to that pulse? So uh, I would actually like to pause and give you a chance to just sketch uh, what you think this is going to look like. Um, and so you, you can see uh, delays here. And I forgot to say that uh, before, that a, a plug flow reactor is in effect offering a delay to, to flow. So always when we had a plug flow in between, you had a signal at zero and then that same signal came out at, at uh, tau P1. So uh, plug flow we, we regard as contributing a delay to flow, okay? So here uh, you've got a delayed flow and then you've got another delayed flow here. But in this case, there's a, a kind of mixing going on, right? Uh, so here you, you've got your fluid flowing through here and then part of that fluid comes out here and, and we have to acknowledge, uh, let's just rewrite this as Q here. So if Q goes in there, Q goes out here, but you see the Q uh, that's going into the reactor here is not just Q, it's Q plus some other Q here. So call this Q bypass, or yeah, well, it's not bypass, uh, Q recycle, right? QR. So QR here, so, so what's going in here, right, at this point 
is more than Q. So you get more than Q going in here. So QR splits out again and you get Q out there. Um, now, the reason I'm pointing that out is um, you, you can think about, yes, you are going to get a delay here, but then part of that flow is going to go back in here and, um, and get delayed and, and it's going to come through here. But, but the point is it's going back. So it, it's like part of your fluid is going back, passing through here. So there's a kind of mixing going on here in this counter current part. There is a part where it just flows straight through and there's a part where it's kind of a mixing going on. So maybe take, take a minute and I, I will suffer you through uh, like a minute silence where you um, think about this, right? So let's take a minute and see if you can sketch out what you think this RTD pattern will end up looking like. Okay, that gave me a chance to catch up on the US elections there, right? Uh, so anyway, uh, so uh, does anybody, uh, would anybody like to comment there? Has anybody uh, come up with uh, any interesting diagrams they, they'd like to describe? No takers, okay. So let's think of it. Um, so you've got your pulse coming in here and your fluid is flowing through. Um, now, yes, you do get fluid flowing uh, in here from, from this section, but um, there's, there's no tracer in there, right? Uh, we've just pulsed tracer in. There's no way for the tracer to have gone right back here. So, so there's no tracer contribution from this part as yet. So that pulse goes through that whole pulse gets delayed by tau P1. And then part of that, remember we are measuring at the exit. So we, we are measuring somewhere here. So part of that pulse comes through here. So we, we get a contribution like this at this point. However, part of that pulse also goes back here. Now the part that goes back is, is now not the same as this. This one is centered on zero. So there's zero over there. So there's zero, but this pulse, uh, the pulse has now been delayed by tau P1. So we now have our pulse going here. So now what comes through here is a further delay. So you've, you've got a pulse here, which is, is delayed by tau P1. And now this gets further delayed by tau P2. So if you draw what comes through here, there's zero, there's tau P1, and there's tau P1 plus tau P2. So tau, and I'm just going to write this as one plus two. So you've got this delay coming through here. And then um, it hits here. Now, by this time, of course, time has passed and we are no longer pulsing more tracer in. So we've only got tracer coming in from, from this, uh, this recycle line. So you've got some tracer coming in here, no more tracer coming from there. So that now gets delayed by tau, uh, tau P1 again, right? So this pulse will only uh, reach the exit if it passes again through this reactor here. 
So it passes through and then we get another pulse here. So, so it's going to appear here at tau at two tau P1 plus tau P2. Oof, my wrists, my, my wrists out here. So, so this is, so that's what we're seeing here. So you are getting more tracer out here. Now, again, we will have some tracer going this way and some tracer going back down this way. And again, we are going to be delayed by a further uh, tau P2 plus tau P1. So we will have here another interval. And this is going to be three tau P1. Uh, uh, how can I write it more easily? So three, one plus two, two, if you, you know what I mean there, right? Three, one plus two times three, yeah. Three times tau P1 plus two times tau P2. So you get another one here. And you'll have noticed that I'm drawing them slightly lower each time. Ugh. Slightly lower each time. And that's because we are losing tracer each time, right? Each time we've got some tracer leaving out here. So, so we are getting less tracer going back in there. So each time we cycle through this, we are losing some tracer. And uh, what you'll find is if you go long enough that this is going to keep dropping like this and, and it's not going to drop linearly, although it's kind of hard to show that here. It's going to exponentially drop out. It's going to have the same interval here, right? Remember on each cycle, it's being delayed by tau P1 plus tau P2, tau P1 plus tau P2. So all these intervals are the same width. And, uh, and we are getting a slow washout. So you can say it's like a CSTR kind of mixing going on in here. So you get this exponential decay out, but at the same time, it's a kind of interrupted exponential decay because you've got the, the plug flow reactors each time are, are delaying the fluid. So that explains that kind of curve. So that's the, the weird RTD shape that you get. And you see it was accomplished in a very simple situation. We just made a counter current plug flow and suddenly we get this really weird RTD shape. Okay, uh, any questions or comments there? Okay, so I'll leave you to think about some of these other reactor types. So do the same thing, right? Imagine uh, a pulse here. What happens to the pulses there? How do they add up at the end? We've talked about this case in the notes in detail. Um, so yeah, you can work through those. Okay, uh, I would like to, okay, let's in fact do this one. So um, let's do question three now. <clears throat> And there's a question too, uh, we want to come back to that, but let's do question three first. It's, it's kind of an easy one. So here we've got a multi-phase flow. So you have um, a gas and a liquid. So here's a liquid um, that's entering here. You can see 0 0.1 cubic meters per second. So that's entering up here and the liquid is flowing down here and out. And then you've also got a gas coming in here, 0 0.5 cubic meters per second. So that's, uh, so this is clearly bubbling through, right? As a gas, it's not like, uh, it's some continuous uh, fluid that's going to happen. So your gas um, enters here, it will form lots of bubbles and it will flow out here. And then you also have some solid particles in this reactor. So there are three phases here, a gas, liquid and solid particles. The solid particles are not moving. So here, uh, read the question from the measured pulse, find the fraction of gas, fraction of flowing liquid and fraction of stagnant liquid in the contactor. So in fact, there are four things. There's, uh, uh, there, there are solid particles, then there's gas, and then there are two liquids, uh, a flowing liquid and a stagnant liquid. So there's some parts of the liquid that are not in motion. 
And we want to estimate, um, I believe it's the amount of stagnant liquid in the system. And if you look at this, there's quite a lot of information given here. Uh, so we know the cross-sectional area of this tube. So there's a one square meter um, cross-sectional area. And then the height here is given to us 20 meters. So clearly um, the volume here is, uh, is 20 cubic meters. We are also given the voidage, right? So uh, 0 0.5 um, and, and that, uh, that that clears up some things very easily. So the voidage, uh, we can just get rid of the solid like that. So we can say um, the solid clearly then takes up half the space. So we are left with 10 cubic meters in that reactor. And beyond that, it seems impossible to us. You know, how are we ever supposed to work out how much stagnant liquid we have here, right? If If you just take a step back and appreciate this problem, Right, without RTD, let's say we never heard of RTD. How on earth are you supposed to ever estimate something like this? How are you supposed to get the amount of stagnant liquid in the first place? Um, it, it just seems impossible to us, right? All we have are flow rates, we have some volumes. We don't know anything about how that liquid is going to distribute itself. It's, it's just impossible, right? There is no way for us to imagine getting uh, any information about the stagnant liquid um, from a, a situation like this, right? And, and then if you think about, well, what if we, we did a tracer study, maybe that will help, right? So it, it can't hurt, right? We always just pulse a little bit of salt in and see what, uh, and measure something on the outside. So uh, we, we add some salt into this liquid and we can measure how the concentration of salt is changing out here. And then for the gas, um, it's not going to be a salt, but maybe we, we add a, a little, some, um, some kind of other component to the gas and we measure the concentration in the gas there. So for the gas, we can also add a tracer. So, and, um, and so we can get two tracers out, right? T-R-A-C-E-S, um, not tracers. So we, we get two, tra uh, two, two profiles, right? Now, um, Number one, first, just to get used to this idea that you can have multiple RTDs in the same reactor. So in your gas, there's a certain age distribution and it's different to our liquid where there's a certain other age distribution. And that's easy enough to imagine. Um, you, you can imagine in, uh, in your classroom, um, you have different uh, types of people there, maybe, uh, it's uh, gender-wise, you could say the males have a certain age distribution, uh, which is different to the females. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's something that, that's real. Uh, it, it's known that males are, are not performing as well academically these days uh, for whatever reason. Um, but you, uh, so you may, have, you may well have in your classroom that the age of the males is, is, is greater than the age of the females. And um, it, it doesn't mean something positive. It means the males are not progressing through the class faster, uh, uh, as fast as the females. So, um, so anyway, you can have in the same space two different populations and their age distributions may be different. So in a similar way here, your gas, um, if, if you go and pulse some trace or whatever it is and measure its trace out here, you'll get a certain age distribution. Um, and its average value may be completely different to the age distribution in the other phase in the liquid. Um, so anyway, uh, that's what we've done. We've uh, pulsed tracer in each phase and those are the age distributions we got out. And, um, and then what we could say is, well, now that I have uh, these concentrations, clearly I can get age distributions. So let, let's just write that up a bit. So question three, we have, um, we can define E in the liquid phase. And we can f define E in the gas phase. So you have these two age distributions. And now we had also talked about the average age in, uh, we, we had said we could estimate the average age 
of a population. Now we have two populations. So we can talk about the average age in the gas phase, right? And obviously that would be using the gas phase age distribution. And the average age in the liquid phase. Liquid phase. And of course, um, those are the space times. So tau sub g. So now that we have those concentration traces, we can estimate uh, the exit age distribution for the gas and for the liquid. And then we can use this, um, this procedure to estimate the average age. And then that's going to be nothing but the space time for the gas and the liquid. And you see that is now fundamentally new information because Formerly, all we knew was the flow rate. Um, we, we had the total volume here, but uh, the only other information was the, the volumetric flow rate. But now that we've got the, uh, the space time as well, we can estimate the volume occupied by each of these phases. So we can say the volume of the gas is nothing but the uh, space time multiplied by the volumetric flow rate. And we can do a similar thing for the liquid. All right, so we've got the space times through this procedure. And there's a bit of work to do in this case, right? You have to integrate under this, um, and, and it's not just the area under this curve, you have to do uh, theta times this curve and then integrate that, and, and then you'll get uh, the space time there. For the liquid, it's much easier. You can see simply here that the average age is 40, right? There's no need to integrate under this curve. Um, it's symmetrical on both sides. Um, just intuitively, when you look at this, you can say the average time spent by the fluid here is, is 40. So, um, so anyway, you can get the tau's in both cases. And then the volumetric flow rates, as we said, are simply given to you with the question. So then you can estimate the volumes occupied by each of these phases. Now, of course, uh, we should note here that this is the flowing liquid. We know there are two liquids, a stagnant liquid and a flowing liquid. And for us to, to even measure uh, a, a, a tracer out of that liquid, that must be coming through the flowing liquid part. So we should be a bit more specific here and say uh, the flowing liquid, so theta average flowing liquid from E of the flowing liquid. So this is the flowing liquid. And so now we have the volume of the flowing liquid. Um, of course, Q is flowing, yeah. Okay, so we have those volumes and, and, and so let's write a total volume balance. So the total volume T equals, there's a volume of the solids part and there's a volume of the stagnant liquid stagnant liquids and volume of the flowing liquids and volume of the gas. So the volume of the solid is simply, um, we can simply estimate that from the voidage. So one minus the voidage is the solid part. So one minus one times Vt and VT uh, is, is no, uh, all this is known, right? Uh, it's 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and VT is a cross-sectional area one times the height 20. So this is uh, 10, right? So VS is known at 10. Uh, v uh, FL is known from here. So this is given, and this we have to calculate. And then VG um, tau we got from here and QG is given with the question. So these two things are known. So the only uh, 
unknown part is VSL. So we can just get that by difference uh, using this equation. Right, so a problem that looked almost impossible uh, through RTD is, is almost quite easy to solve. Okay, uh, any questions or comments there? Right now, I want to come back to this problem, but it actually is the next problem anyway. Right, so here uh, we are told we have non-coalescing droplets. So uh, you've got some reactor and you've got, um, and, and we don't know what type of mixing uh, that is, but we've got this reactor and uh, it's being fed by a stream, a liquid stream but the stream is a two phase stream. So it has one continuous liquid and it also has droplets uh, suspended in that liquid. And, and those droplets are not coalescing. So even if they collide, they don't combine and form bigger droplets, they retain uh, droplets. And, and so um, the droplets are entering at a specific concentration. So maybe just to draw that. Let's just steal one of these. Uh, okay, let's just try it again. <clears throat> so you've got um, you've got some kind of reactor mixing type unspecified, and you've got a stream here and a stream going out here. And in the stream, you have little droplets. So you are going to get droplets in here, obviously. And in the entering side of it, the concentration here is known at two so um, it's two moles per liter. So two moles per liter. That's uh, how the droplet comes in. And then within the droplet, the reaction happens. So uh, your droplet is reacting in itself. At component A in your in your droplet, right? So the droplet is obviously some mixture. It, it, it's uh, maybe multiple components in each droplet, um, but the concentration of A in that droplet initially is two moles per liter. And then A is being converted to R as time goes on. And we know the, the reaction kinetics. So it, it may seem crazy, but even in that droplet, we can define the kinetics going on in there and we can define the kinetic rate constant inside that droplet and uh, even the rate expression. So KCA squared, that's what's going on in the droplet. Um, and uh, the, the RTD for the reactor is shown here. And you see this, uh, this is nothing that we, we know at all, right? The, the, this reactor type, this doesn't fit any of the, the types of reactors that we might know. Um, a CSTR we know is an exponential die-off, a PFR has that direct delta spike. Um, even a laminar flow reactor, we have done that and we had that kind of cubic die-off. This doesn't fit any of those. And um, it, it's just uh, some weird reactor. And, and that could have happened because of the weird internal geometry. We, we may have baffles and other things to, to shift the flow around. So however it happened, there, there's some uh, weird RTD in this reactor. So I'm, I'm saying this because now we have a reactor type that formerly we had no clue how to model. There's no way for us to estimate a conversion or a reaction rate in, in a reactor of this nature. But now with RTD, um, we uh, can think about doing something um, like um, a segregation model. So if you look in the, the notes, um, we describe the segregation model where we can estimate the overall conversion for a fluid 
that is discrete by discrete we mean that it's composed of um, distinct elements it's not that it's uh, kind of socially aware or something it's a dis it's discrete in the sense that it, it's it's discontinuous there are different parts to that fluid um, maybe a bit more precisely um, if, if you have let's say you have a, a big space like this with all the molecules free to move around then every molecule is free to react with with every other molecule but if instead of that in your reactor space let's say you had little packets of fluid and in each packet the reaction could only happen there right then that's what we mean by a discrete fluid so you still have molecules, obviously, but uh, the reaction is happening uh, more locally. And um, the, the distinction here is that the hydrodynamics are in terms of these packets. So in this case, when we talked about uh, the mixing pattern and the RTD and all that, that referred to the whole fluid. So the RTD of the fluid here was the same as the RTD of these little um, of these molecules, whereas in this case, when we talk about RTD, we are referring to the packets. So these uh, these big particles, if you like, they have some RTD. They they spend a certain age in that reactor, but inside those particles, all, all those little molecules, all those are moving with that that packet. So the the molecules are not free to have their own rtd there doesn't exist a non-trivial rtd here everything is is one age inside that packet and those packets are moving around now <clears throat> if you think about it a way to model such a situation is using little batch reactors so imagine um, each uh, each particle here as its own little batch reactor because if we think about what this means, right, each particle is, um, the reaction is happening inside of it. That's uh, nothing but a batch reactor to us. So, um, and, and I'm saying this because that then tells us how we can start modeling this. So we can, we can say inside each droplet, we can identify a, a batch reactor. And so let's start just um, writing a balance on that batch reactor. So we, we can say for a batch reactor, the balance is simply DCA dt is equal to the rate of formation of A. In this case, A is being consumed. So it's minus K times C sub A. And it's, uh, it's a second order reaction. So that's given with the problem. So we are told uh, RA, uh, so minus RA, um, yeah, KCA squared. So so this is DCA dt's RA, so it's minus KCA squared. And then, of course, we can integrate this if we uh, rewrite this as, well, let's copy this. So we can rewrite this in the denominator here and then shift this out there. I'll also take the minus sign here. And then, <clears throat> of course, uh, the derivative of one over x is equal to uh, minus one over x squared. So this is nothing but one over CA. And so we can write this as one over CA. So that's the integral. And of course, the integration limits are, um, so this little droplet has entered at time, uh, at time zero, so sub zero. And then we are going to consider uh, some future time theta. So it's uh, some future age theta. So, um, and, and at that time, it, it will have concentration CA. So, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm messing this up. It, so the initial value of the concentration in that, uh, that little batch reactor is CA naught, C sub A naught. And, <clears throat> And then uh, at some time in the future, at some age in the future, it's going to have a concentration CA. No, that's not gonna work. 
Yeah, I'm just going to write this as C sub A for the upper limit, right? So that's going to equal K, K times T minus T naught, which we know is theta. Right, so we can rewrite this as one over C sub A naught minus one over one over C C A equals K theta. Or we can rewrite this as um, C A equals, and then take them um, one over a, a C A naught onto the other side. Let me just think here, take that across there. Is there a minus sign? Minus. So it looks right. So it's one over A beta, and then minus one over C A naught. Then if you multiply top and bottom by C A naught, you can write this as C A naught over theta C A naught minus one. And then, um, so that's C A as a function of theta. It feels like this, okay, anyway. And uh, then of course we can find conversion is one minus C A over C A naught equals, so it's going to be one minus C A over C A naught. So we can get rid of that C A naught on the top there and rewrite this as one over um, K theta C A naught minus one. And then one minus that, let's bring that one into the numerator. So it's one minus this stuff. That one minus that. Yeah, there's definitely a mistake somewhere here. C A. The lower limit. Oh, I've done this the wrong way around. So this should be C A minus C A naught, right? The upper limit minus the lower limit. C A minus C A naught. So you take that across there and then that's a plus. So K theta and then one over. Um, let's just do this step a bit more carefully. You take this across and then you do one over everything. So it's A is one over all the stuff. And then you multiply by C A naught, C C A naught. Multiplying top and bottom by C A naught, you get C A naught here and C A naught there. And then, uh, yeah, so that's that's what I was looking for. And then we want conversion is one minus C A over C A naught. So uh, you can uh, uh, divide that and this was supposed to be a plus. And uh, then when you take one minus that, going to be that. So you can see here, this is the one minus one can disappear, leaving us with this stuff. All right, so conversion as a function of age looks like this K theta C A naught over K theta C A naught plus one. So that's X as a function of theta.
Okay, so that, that's how in a segregated fluid, you can find conversion as a function of age. Now, what we still need to do is uh, integrate this to get the overall conversion. So we are not interested in, um, in an individual oil droplet. We are not interested in, in such a small element of the fluid. We want as engineers to know what's the total conversion across the whole body of fluid here. So to, to get that, we estimate the overall conversion like this. We take the averaged conversion over all droplets uh, using the age distribution. And, and now we need uh, E of theta. Now we do have uh, C as a function of T. So we've done a pulse tracer experiment and this is the result we got. But unfortunately here, there's no value given to us uh, for some strange reason, maybe it got lost. Um, but the only thing we can say is that we know it's, it's flat here. There's a constant number here. It's zero here and zero here. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and we don't seem to know what the number is here. Maybe uh, take 30 seconds and uh, maybe you can tell me what's the value uh, over here. Well, not for C, but uh, for E of theta, what, what's the value there? In fact, that's a big clue I gave you right there. So uh, any takers? Ain't no answers yet. So we know that the integral under E of theta must be one, right? Um, we can see here that uh, E of theta in this case is going to be, it's going to be a three part function. So we have to just use some brackets here. Um, so let's use this one. So we can see E equals some constant K and this is between certain limits. So for theta, you can see when theta is more than or equal to one, um, it's a constant and then, uh, yeah, so, so between one and three, it's a constant. So it's a constant, we'll call it K between one and three. So theta is more than or equal to one and less than or equal to three. And otherwise it's a zero. So in all other situations, it's zero. Uh, you can write in the, the ranges there. <clears throat> so the integral of E of theta um, is going to be, so the, if you take the, the full integral, the integral between zero and infinity for E in theta, we know that equals one. Now, if you look at this, you can see it's going to be zero before one and zero after three. So it doesn't make sense for us to go and, and write integration for us to do any integration where it's zero. We might as well just integrate between one and three. So we can say instead of this, Gonna move this out here. Yeah. So instead of integrating naught to infinity, I'm going to integrate instead between one and three. And between one and three, my value of E is K, right? It's this unknown constant K that we are trying to find. And of course, K is a constant. So this integrates to K times theta. So this is nothing but um, K 
beta, and this is between limits three and one, which is equal to k times three minus one, which is two k. In other words, k, e k equals one over two. Right, so the, uh, in terms of E of theta, the height here is one over two. So that's our function fully specified. So we know then that our integral here is going to be as simple as uh, the integral between one and three, three here and one here. And then for E, it's just one half. And in fact, I'll just take the half out here. And then your x of theta, we found through some labor was this. And, and that's the answer, right? You can, of course, go ahead and stick numbers in. So k and ca naught are given with the question. So you can generate this function. And by the way, I did do that just out of interest here. Where do it go here? So yeah, uh, K and CA naught, you can see the same numbers in the question. And you can see here KCA naught A over one plus KCA naught A, so A for theta. And then uh, it looks like that. So you basically integrate under this curve here and just divide by two, and that's your answer. Okay, so that's pretty much it for this problem. Okay. Um, any questions or comments so far? All right, if not, um, then there are a couple more problems I'd like to do. So we'll set up another Zoom session for that. And I might put out a, a last couple of videos, but that's basically it for uh, my section of the course. Um, so um, yeah, we'll just uh, confirm a time. It will probably be the same time slot, but I'll just check with Prof Lockett whether uh, this time slot is available. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll continue with the last bit of problems uh, for my section of the course. Uh, any questions or comments so far? All right, if not, that's it for today. Thank you all very much.